Welcome back, everybody. We're happy to have you and very excited for our afternoon program. Laura Ling is the host and reporter of E! Investigates, a documentary series on the E! Network, which explores topics such as teen suicide and the challenges for 140 days before being granted a special pardon in returning to the United States. She has since sought to shine a light on the issue of trafficked women, as well as to bring greater attention to the plight of other imprisoned journalists around the world. Laura is co-author of Somewhere Inside, One Sister's Captivity in North Korea and the Other's Fight to Bring Her Home, that she penned with her sister Lisa. Please join me, it's very special, and we're very honored at BIA to host Laura Ling to our stage. Hi everyone, thank you Joan for that kind introduction. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, in, in March of 2009, I thought I might never get the chance to see my family ever again. But just this morning before coming here, I kissed my almost six-year-old daughter and my two-and-a-half-year-old son, the children I once thought I might never get the chance to have. And speaking of my daughter, when I told her that I was going to be in a room full of women designers, architects, engineers, builders. She was so excited. She, she, wanted, she asked me if she could come. And uh, so, so maybe one of these years I can bring her. But thank you for making me look so good in the eyes of my daughter. I, I, I truly appreciate that. It is, it is an honor and a blessing to be here with you this afternoon. I do have to say, it is a little odd to be known as one of the women Bill Clinton rescued from North Korea. <laughs> Um, or that North Korean girl, as I'm sometimes referred to as. But if what happened to me allows me to tell the story that I set out to tell, I will gladly wear those designations. Today I'd like to talk about not only the story I was working on along the Chinese-North Korean border, but also about some of the other issues that are close to my heart. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a suburb outside of Sacramento, California. It was a very all-American, cookie-cutter, pretty non-diverse community. There weren't many, uh, many kids in my neighborhood that looked looked like my sister Lisa and me. I would say in our high school of 2,000 or so students, there were six, seven Asians, two of whom came from the same family, ours. Um, and I just, so I just felt uh, uncomfortable and different in my own skin. And then for college, I landed at UCLA, also known as the University of Caucasians Lost Amongst Asians. <laughs> This whole, this whole world of diversity opened up to me, and it was very exhilarating. I met uh, peers from all walks of life. My uh, three closest friends during my freshman year in college, one was a young gay man who hadn't yet come out to his family. One was a conservative Christian girl from nearby in Huntington Beach, and another was a young Latino man who was the first in his family to go to college. And I think being exposed to so much diversity was one of the reasons why I wanted to pursue journalism to travel the world so that I could expose myself to different people and cultures and situations and to share those experiences with others. 
Over the last 16 years, I have had the opportunity to travel the world working as a journalist, covering issues ranging from slave labor in the Amazon to the humanitarian crisis in Haiti to the challenges faced by military families here at home. Many of the people I have met along the way have moved and inspired me and have really shaped my worldview. One of the areas that I have been particularly interested in covering over the years has been the struggle for freedom in different parts of the world, as well as the battles that we hold within ourselves that make us feel in prison. I never truly understood what a luxury our freedom is until I went out into the world and met people who had risked their lives for greater freedom, and until I lost my own. In February of 2008, I was in Myanmar, a country formerly known as Burma. At the time, it was ruled by a military junta. Um, people were toiling to earn a dollar a day. Electricity blackouts were frequent. It cost a couple thousand dollars to own a cell phone. The internet was censored. And I visited a border town in Thailand where I met up with a group of Buddhist monks who had been participating in some street demonstrations in Myanmar, asking that their government provide them with some basic necessities, like electricity. But they were repelled by armed soldiers, and they watched as their fellow monks were beaten, jailed, and killed just for speaking out. And now these monks were too afraid to return home for fear of losing their own lives. I asked one of the young monks if he felt nervous when he was demonstrating, and he said, of course we were nervous because we didn't have any weapons or guns to defend us. We were just wearing our sandals and our robes. There isn't a person in this world that isn't afraid of a gun. Well, his words would come back to haunt me about a year later when I would find myself staring down the barrel of a rifle held by a North Korean soldier. Myanmar held its first free elections at the end of last year, and I would argue that those peaceful protests led by those monks was a kind of turning point, because despite the government's attempt to control the media and censor the internet, images of those protests were captured surreptitiously on cell phones and made their way to the internet um, so that the world could see what was going on, and it really sparked this international outcry. And so while those monks didn't have guns to defend themselves, they had a different kind of weapon in the internet, which proved to be extremely powerful. Over the years, I have traveled to parts of the Middle East and have seen some of the different ways in which women with their heads and much of their bodies covered have been making their voices heard. In Iran, on the streets of Tehran, Iran, I would see women wearing the obligatory headscarf, but every now and again I would see some women exposing some very small tufts of their hair. It was a very slight gesture, but it was a defiant one nonetheless. Now, while women in many Muslim countries are forced to wear the hijab or head covering, which many of us in the Western world see as degrading, some women in Turkey, a country that is predominantly Muslim, have been fighting for their right to wear the headscarf in government offices, something which they have been banned from doing for decades. I spoke with young women who support the ban, and they said that allowing women to wear the scarf in government offices is a threat to that country's secular state. And I also interviewed young women who choose to wear the scarf, sometimes to the dismay of their own parents, who said that they view themselves as feminists, just fighting for their basic rights in a democratic country. The ban against wearing the scarf in government offices was lifted in October 2013, and it has allowed more women to have access to job opportunities in the public sector. Now, I've mentioned that I've been to both Iran and Turkey, and I've actually worn the headscarf in both places. And I remember coming home without the scarf and feeling just a little bit more self-conscious because for so many days I'd been covered up. And I guess I became a little less concerned about what I was wearing and my overall appearance. And then to return home to image after image in the media of you know, ultra skinny women wearing a little bit too much made makeup, having had a little too much work done, um, I, I almost miss wearing the scarf. Well, not that much, but 
But my point is that, you know, while forcing women to cover themselves is no doubt oppressive, I sometimes wonder if we can be a little too quick to judge. Sometimes we see women covered up and we think that they must be these subservient creatures, but perhaps we are the ones that have become slaves to a society that puts too much pressure on our appearances. Just before I started working on the story about North Korean defectors, I was finishing up another story about the drug war in Mexico. I was in Ciudad Juarez, which is right across the border from El Paso, Texas. El Paso has been considered one of the safest cities in America, but right across the border in Ciudad Juarez, they have a higher death rate than Baghdad. I was there profiling a local journalist named Arturo. Arturo um, was a handsome young man. He was in his late 20s. He just got married and was excited about starting his life with his new wife. And for many days, we rode around with Arturo from one murder site to the next. The number of and method of drug-related killings in Mexico is out of control. As we all know, living in Southern California, so close to the border. Um, in, in the span of a few hours, I visited three different sites where half a dozen people had been murdered. I remember pulling up to a supermarket parking lot and seeing this shiny black Mustang with fancy rims and it was sprayed with dozens and dozens of bullet holes. The bodies of the two young men inside were completely mutilated. It was one of the more gruesome scenes I'd ever witnessed. But people were going about things as if it were just a normal day. Shoppers continued doing their shopping. Kids played about nearby. The violence has become so frequent that people are becoming immune to it. In the last few years, there have been tens of thousands of drug-related murders in Mexico. Drug traffickers have been holding a society hostage, and it's also become one of the world's deadliest places for journalists. It's people like Arturo who are out there on the front lines every day, risking their lives in search of the truth. Journalists know that certain stories do entail risk, but we also know that leaving issues ignored can be detrimental for us as a society, and we have to weigh those risks and take the appropriate precautions. But at the day, end of the day, anything can happen. And on the morning of March 17, 2009, the worst did happen to my colleague, Yuna Lee, and to me. We had traveled to northeastern China on behalf of Current TV, which is a, was a cable channel that was co-owned by former Vice President Al Gore. Our team consisted of myself, I was the correspondent, Yuna Lee, who was the associate producer and translator, um, Mitch Koss, who was our producer and camera person. And we were there covering a story about North Korean defectors. Um, people who are fleeing or being trafficked from their homeland where hunger is widespread and where even the most basic of rights is being denied. The majority of people who defect from North Korea are women, but rather than finding safe haven across the border in China, many of them find themselves caught up in a different kind of desperation. Some are sold into marriages to Chinese men, Others are lured into the prostitution industry. Because of China's one-child policy, which has limited the number of children that most families can have to one, many female fetuses have been aborted so that families can try for that prized son. And while the government recently relaxed this policy, finally allowing families to have more than one child, the decades-long policy has had a dramatic impact on the genetic makeup of that country. In 2012, there were an estimated 40 million million more men than young women. And by 2020, there could be 30 million men of marrying age without spouses. So for all you single ladies in the house, <laughs> head on over to China. Um, but in all seriousness, um, the situation, in all seriousness, the situation has become so problematic that um, human trafficking and forced prostitution have become rampant in parts of China. And one of the places where women are being trafficked from to become brides to Chinese men is from North Korea. 
I interviewed a woman who, from North Korea, had, who had been sold into a marriage, and she said that she actually considered herself lucky because even though her husband was the poorest person in her village, um, she felt better off than some of the other women from North Korea who were living in abusive marriages and sold like livestock into these marriages. She said that her husband um, was not violent towards her. And she said that at least I could find white rice in China as opposed to having to scavenge for food in North Korea. I interviewed a young woman. Um, she was in her 20s. She'd recently been trafficked out of North Korea. And she said that a smuggler had told her that she could find a job working with computers across the border. And you know, she, she said that things were so dire in her country, she said that she was allowed to eat meat about three times a year on very special occasions. And so when she heard that there were opportunities working with computers, she thought that she would go and earn some extra money to help her family. Um, after she was smuggled across the border, she did find that she was placed in a job working with computers. It just was not quite as she expected. She was forced to chat with men online and undress for them via webcam. She held her arms behind her back to demonstrate the way in which her boss tied her up to keep her from leaving the room in which she was being held. Tears streamed down her face when she talked about how much she missed her mother. The one thing that stood out uh, with nearly every person, about nearly every person I, I interviewed, was his or her size and build. I am a relatively petite person, but I seemed enormous compared to some of the people I was interviewing. A girl in her 20s resembled a 12 or 13 year old. A study done on teenage boys who have defected from North Korea sh showed that they are on, on average five inches shorter and weigh 25 pounds less than teenage boys in South Korea. On the morning of March 17th, our team traveled to the Tumen River. This is the river, this is a thoroughfare that separates China and North Korea. And we were there with our guide, our local guide. Journalists who work overseas sometimes hire local guides who we refer to as our fixers. These are people who know the area well, they've worked with journalists, they know the issue. And so on that morning, our, our fixer took us to an area along the Tumen River. We weren't there intending to cross into North Korea, but we did want to show this area where so many people are being smuggled across. And on that morning, um, the ice was frozen. It was in March, the, ice, the river was still frozen, excuse me. And so we stepped foot on that ice and we were walking along that uh, frozen river. I was conducting what we call a stand-up, just kind of explaining to the camera what happens in this area. And that's when our guide, our fixer, proceeded to motion for us to follow him, and he was walking towards the other side of the river. And we did, we followed him. We ended up on the other side of the river um, for about a minute, got a few shots, turned around and left. And it was about halfway back across that river when I heard yelling. I turned around and I saw two North Korean soldiers with their rifles raised in the air and they were running toward us. And we just ran for our lives. I remember just about, I was just about to run back onto Chinese soil when my boot struck the ice and caused it to fall into the, the water. And I lunged my body onto the soil, picked myself up, and continued to run. But I was so overcome by fear that I just felt the weight of the world pulling me down. And I couldn't run any longer. Yuna was behind me, and as she came up to approach me, she stopped to help me, and that's when to the two soldiers just were, were on top of us. Um, Mitch, our producer, and the guy got away. Go figure the dudes get away, right? <laughs> well, those soldiers were very determined to get us back into North Korea and fast. 
and we were determined to do everything in our power to stay in China. I, um, I just lay on the ground trying to make the, my body as heavy as possible. The, the, the soldier who was dragging me was particularly ferocious and he proceeded to kick me in the head, the shoulder, the jaw over and over. And finally he would drag me onto the ice. It was when I was on that ice when I remembered that I still had a wireless microphone attached to my sweater and I wondered if my producer, Mitch, could hear me. Mitch, I said, I think I'm going to die. At that moment, I looked up. I saw the soldier raise his gun. He brought the butt of it on my head and I blacked out immediately. Now, the ironic thing was that this wasn't a story in which I was necessarily fearful for my own life. In terms of being scared about my own physical well-being, I was probably more scared while working on the story about the drug war in Mexico. For this story, our biggest and our main concern was always the safety and security of the people we've been interviewing. And so we were always careful to conceal their identities when they were talking to us or meet to them in places that were far from where they worked or lived. But anything can happen once you're out there in the field. Situations you could never have planned for evolve, and you're forced to react. And in that moment, on the ice, I relied on my instincts. And my instincts failed me. Some have speculated that we were set up. A paper out of South Korea alleged that the former deputy director of North Korea's state security apparatus was actually planning and orchestrating our abduction and was working our, with our guide um, to take us to that location along the river. At the end of the day, I do not want or I do not like to speculate or blame anyone but myself. It was my choice to follow our guide along that river. And what ensued was the most terrifying time of my life. At one moment, I'm a journalist reporting on a humanitarian crisis that's taking place along the border with China and North Korea that neither country wants the world to know about. And in the very next moment, I'm a prisoner in one of the most isolated countries in the world, one that viewed my own, views my own as its enemy. I didn't know if I would ever see my family again. I didn't know if I would survive until the next day. North Korea really is this black hole. If you take a look at a satellite image of the Korean Peninsula, you'll see that South Korea, which is one of the most wired, technologically advanced countries in the world, looks like Las Vegas on steroids. It's just gleaming and gleaming with lights. And then you look above the 38th parallel, where the two countries have been separated since 1953, and you'll see that the northern part is pitch black. The North Korean leadership has likewise kept its people in the dark with its harsh totalitarian system. And much of what goes on inside that country remains a mystery to the outside world. On that first day of our captivity, Yuna and I were shuttled from one dusty army base to the next. And at one location, for a very brief moment, we were left alone with some of our belongings. And we knew that we had some things in our possession that would not be looked upon favorably by the North Korean authorities, including a notebook where I had written down questions that could have been interpreted as being critical of the North Korean government. And so we very nervously and quickly tried to get rid of that information. We ripped up my notes, swallowed some of them, some I stuck in my pocket and later put down a toilet. But after a few moments, the guards rushed in, they blindfolded us, grabbed us, and grabbed us and pushed us outside. The only sounds that I could hear were the military drills of North Korean soldiers, and I could feel them getting closer and closer, louder and louder. I could feel my heart just wanting to leap outside of my body. I thought that we were being led to our execution. That's how scared I was. But we were shoved into a vehicle and transferred to a dismal jail where we spent the next few nights. We were held in separate cells. They were five by six foot pitch black cells. I could hear the faint sounds of North Korean prisoners um, in being held in the cell next to mine. After a few days, we were transferred to North Korea's capital city, Pyongyang. And that's when Yuna and I were separated for the remainder of our captivity. And that's when the real interrogation process began. And I was grilled for hours, hour after hour, day after day. 
Um, interro the interrogator wanted to know everything about my private and personal life. Uh, my, the biggest obstacle was trying to convince them that I was not a spy. It didn't help that the co-founder of my company was former Vice President Al Gore. Um, at one point they asked, have you ever had anything to do with the CIA? Well, actually I'd reported inside the CIA a few years prior. And I had tried to sort of stick with the truth as much as I could during that interrogation. But when he asked me that question, I just said no. When I wasn't being interrogated, I would just walk circles barefoot around the room, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them until I couldn't stand up any longer. The biggest fear I had was for my family. I wondered what the stress of not knowing where I was or how I was was doing to them. I was allowed to watch some television with my guards. All media in North Korea is very tightly controlled. It's one of the ways the government has been able to maintain its very firm grip on power through this propaganda network. And to this day, I can still hum the tune of North Korea's national anthem that was being played every evening when the television service starts by the North Korean men's military choir. I just, as much as I try, I cannot get that damn song out of my head. Um, but aside from being interrogated and being able to watch some TV, I was totally isolated. There was no one to talk to, and I was just overcome with fear. At times, I would try to make some small talk with my guards, and every now and again, they would let their guards down, and we'd just make this little chit-chat. Those conversations, however brief, just lifted my spirits. I remember one day, one of my guards was sobbing. I don't know why she was crying, but I felt compelled to reach out and hug her. And I knew that I could be taking this big risk by embracing this woman whose job it was to keep me prisoner. But in that moment, I didn't care. And I reached my arms around her, I embraced her, and uh, you know, after a few, she immediately stiffened up, but after a few seconds, I let go, a little apprehensive as to how she would react. And she offered me a very slight smile, as if she appreciated that gesture. Now, while I did want to be consoling to my guard, I really hugged her for selfish reasons. After feeling so alone and scared, just that small physical interaction with another human being made me feel more alive. Yuna and I became the first Americans to be, held, uh, to be tried in North Korea's highest court. And I vividly remember that day when the judge handed down the sentence. He and his associates left the room for five minutes to deliberate before returning with their judgment of 12 years in one of North Korea's notorious labor camps. I remember the judge, um, the interpreter, interpreting for the judge who shouted, no forgiveness, no appeal. I clutched onto the podium to keep from falling over. What many people may not realize is that that sentence was broken down into two parts, two years and 10 years, and that the majority of the sentence, 10 years, was given not for walking across that, that river, but for the work that we had been doing as journalists. The North Korean government is perhaps one of the parano most paranoid regimes in the world, so anything that deviates from this very perfect image it has built for itself is considered a threat. The fact that we had been interviewing North Korean defectors who had some critical things to say about their country meant that we had hostile intentions. My experience in the so-called hermit kingdom is filled with terrifying moments from being beaten and dragged into the country, to being threatened and interrogated, to even being accused of trying to bring down the North Korean government. But I want to take a few moments and share with you all some glimmers of compassion and humanity that I also experienced. One day, one of my guards had gone home to visit her family, and when she returned, I asked if she had a nice time seeing them. And she looked down, she looked a little bit forlorn, and she said, I did, but I feel badly, badly that I, you could, you're separated from your family, um, that I could see mine when you've been separated from yours for so long. Another guard, after learning that I'd just been sentenced to 12 years hard labor, seemed genuinely shocked and saddened for me. I was huddled up in a ball in a corner, crying uncontrollably, and she came up to me and she said something that I'll never forget. Laura, she said, 
always have hope. These are young women who were cold and mean and intimidating to me when I first met them. They looked at me as their enemy. And I looked at them as perfect models of then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il's mass propaganda machine. They were always quick to spew anti-US rhetoric, and they spoke about their leader as if he were this otherworldly godlike figure. But I mention these moments because I do think that they are a testament to what can happen when people from enemy nations or really opposite ends of a spectrum get a chance to interact and communicate. Our perceptions of one another can grow and widen. If we only take that chance to engage with those we consider different, we might find out how much we actually have in common. During those 140 days, there were many breaking points and many turning points, lows followed by highs, lows again, sometimes just this feeling of numbness. I know that it was the same for my family who was worried here at home. And I would be lying if I said I never contemplated taking my own life. Sometimes I did find myself in the darkest and loneliest of places from which I might never be able to escape except by ending it all. I now know what a horrible mistake it was to even consider such a thing. In my heart, I did know and believe that my family would never give up trying to bring me home. And one of the biggest comforts that I had during that time were the letters that they sent. And I was fortunate to be able to receive letters every now and again. I read and reread each and every letter. I memorized each and every word. Uh, my father is not a very verbose guy, but just reading those words, Daddy loves you, would warm my heart. My mom would send me Bible passages, uplifting quotes, and meditation techniques. My husband is a pretty introverted guy, um, but he poured everything he had and every ounce of love into those letters to me. They truly were my oxygen. My husband and I developed a kind of meeting time where at 9 a.m. in North Korea and 5 p.m. in Los Angeles, we would look outside our respective windows and think about one another. He would scan photos of himself sitting at our dining room table where he would write to me so that I could envision him in that moment, in that place. My sister's letters were a little more strategic. My sister, Lisa, is a journalist, and she knew that I wasn't the only person reading those letters. In fact, sometimes the letters would arrive with coffee stains on them. So I don't know how many eyes perused them before they got to me, but I'm sure that it was many. Uh, and Lisa was, knew this as well. In her letters, she was always trying to express messages of deference and respect to the North Korean authorities. And I think that her strategy worked because eventually I was allowed to make a few phone calls home specifically to try to tell my sister what I thought was necessary, going to be necessary to get us home. The difficult part was that the North Korean authorities would never tell me outright what it was that they wanted. And so it really was like just trying to decipher this puzzle and hope that I was right. After, some, have com some people have commented on my sister's unrelenting will and determination to get us home. Her response is, you would do the same thing if it were your brother or your sister, your son or your daughter. After several discussions with the North Korean authorities, it became pretty clear to me that the only person who would be seen as an acceptable envoy to secure our release was none other than former President Bill Clinton. And so can you imagine calling your sister and saying, hi, Lisa, do you think President Clinton can come to North Korea to rescue us? It was, that was actually one of the lowest points in my captivity because I truly did not think that somebody of President Clinton's stature would be approved to make such an unpredictable journey. And so from that moment, I began to really prepare myself mentally to spend a lot of time in North Korea. But a few weeks later, um, it was the beginning of August, Yuna and I were suddenly reunited and we were taken to a hotel. And we were told that we were a very important envoy had just touched down in Pyongyang and that if his visit went well, we might get to go home. And if it didn't go well, we would not go home. 
We weren't told who this envoy was, just that it was somebody who I had requested. And I had made a few other requests in addition to asking for President Clinton. One of them, in fact, was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> But being the, at the time, the governor of California, my home state, I thought that that might make sense. And also because despite North Korea being one of the most closed off countries in the world where people have very little access to information from the outside world, it was believed that then leader, North Korean leader Kim Jong-il was a huge movie buff and that he had one of the biggest movie collections in the world. So I thought maybe a visit from the Terminator might secure our release. <laughs> So we were at this hotel and we were ushered down this dark hallway. It was lined with about a dozen North Korean security agents. They were stone-faced looking down. And at the end of the hallway, um, I spotted a bald American wearing an earpiece. It was a US Secret Service agent. And I immediately felt the presence of my country before me. After that, these two double doors opened, and there standing before us was President Bill Clinton. I don't know if it was the lighting in the room or my utter state of astonishment and disbelief, but I swear he had a halo. It was like these doors opened, it was like, hallelujah. Um, it was the most surreal thing, and you know, he, he wanted to know how we were, how, how we, were we in decent health. Um, he told us that he still had some work to, to do, but he felt confident he would see us on the plane ride home the following day. I don't know if any of you remember, there was a photo that came out of, uh, uh, with President Clinton and Kim Jong-il standing side by side, and President Clinton has this very stoic look about him. He told me later on that he had to very carefully practice that expression that Hillary and Chelsea were coaching him because he couldn't look too jovial, otherwise it would seem like he was chumming it up with the North Korean leader, and he couldn't look too despondent and risk offending the North Koreans. It had to be just right, and so he spent a lot of time practicing that stoic look because President Clinton doesn't look stoic very often. <laughs> a lot of people ask, why Bill Clinton? Why was he the one that was needed to serve as the envoy for your release? And I guess the simple answer is that Kim Jong-il just always wanted to meet him. And there might be some truth to that. Um, I, but it may have to do with something that happened about two decades prior. So when we were on the plane ride home, President Clinton told me that when he met with Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-il told him that when Kim Jong-il's father passed away in 1994, um, sorry, his father, Kim Il-sung, passed away in 1994, President Clinton was the first leader to call Kim Jong-il to offer his condolences even before Kim's own allies. He told Clinton that he always remembered that gesture and wanted to meet him ever since. So I just think it's, it's wild that one possible reason for a release from North Korea can be traced back to that simple phone call that happened so long ago. And I think it is a reminder that the things we do today have ripple effects that might impact our lives and others in ways that we can't imagine. While I was in captivity, I had a lot of time to reflect on my life a lot of time to ask myself, did I use my time wisely? Was my life well spent? My career in journalism has at times been grueling and risky, but I felt glad that I had followed my passion by trying to shine light on issues that need the world's attention. But I also had plenty of regrets, and one of them was not spending enough time with my family, not telling my parents, my husband, my sister, often enough how much I love and appreciate them. We all live these very busy, stressful lives, but one day we will wish we had more time with the people we love. Not a day goes by when I don't think about something that happened during my experience in North Korea. A wound on my head is a constant reminder of the day I thought I might die. But more than anything, the darkest period of my life was also the biggest test of my strength. 
I exercised and meditated every chance that I could to keep my spirits and my energy up. I knew that I couldn't just sit and wait around for somebody else to decide my fate. I tried to engage my captors every chance I could to try to find out what was needed to get us home. About a year after I returned from North Korea, I began working for the E! Network, reporting for their investigative series called E! Investigates. And some of you who are familiar with E! might be going, hmm, that's an odd choice to go work for an entertainment channel. And I, I thought the same thing. I, was, I thought, what do they want me to do? Report on the dating life of the Kardashians? <laughs> like, probably not the best fit for me. But I was pleasantly surprised when um, the folks at E! told me that they wanted me to report on issues impacting young Americans. And so I thought, well, if a fraction of the audience that watches the Kardashians tunes in to, say, a piece on teen suicide and depression, then maybe I can have a little, little impact. And it was actually that story working on teen suicide and depression that was one of the more emotional stories that I've covered, because I was looking at that issue through the lens of being a new mom and as somebody who had once contemplated taking my own life during my experience in North Korea. I was in a classroom in Talawanda High School in Ohio where I met a group of students who sp spoke about the pressures that they face from being bullied to getting broken up with to just feeling stressed out about their futures. Nearly every person I talked to said that he or she felt depressed at some point in their lives but they were too embarrassed to talk about it because it was this admission of failure. Our story, which took us all across the country, where we met young people from all walks of life, was meant to let them know that they are not alone and that there is help. Some of us here may be dealing with our own obstacles that have left us feeling confused, alone, even depressed. As Americans, we have faced huge challenges. Ethnic, racial, and religious tensions divide us. In the US, women face a pay gap in nearly every occupation. Inequality be between America's rich and poor is at a 30-year high, and, and this disparity continues to grow around the world. But no matter how difficult things get, we just have to, as my North Korean guard once told me, hold on to hope. It will lead us through to brighter days. One of the things that I did during my captivity to maintain hope and to get on to the next day was to practice the act of gratitude. I would think about something that happened. So every evening before I went to sleep, I would sit cross-legged and I would think about something that happened in that day that I actually felt grateful for, despite the bleak situation I was in. And so I'd say to myself, for example, I feel lucky I saw a butterfly outside my window, even though I can't breathe the fresh air. Or I feel grateful that my interrogator didn't berate or threaten me today. He was actually kind. I feel lucky I got three meals today, even though the portions were meager, because they were probably more than what the average North Korean was getting. Thinking about these small things allowed me to get on to the next day, and it's something that I continue to do to this day. I find that it can bring a sense of not only peace, but of purpose. And so this evening, I will express my thanks and gratitude for being able to be here with all of you today. People wonder if I'm scarred, whether I suffer from PTSD. I get the occasional nightmare, the occasional panic attack. But more than anything, I can't help but just recognize how incredibly lucky I am to be home and to be free. And so I can only look at each new day as this precious little treasure. I want to do things that have meaning. I want to make my children proud. You all should be very proud of the work that you are doing as women in the building industry. While you are literally building foundations for a better society, you are breaking down barriers in what has long been regarded as a male-dominated field. Plain and simple, as my daughter told me this morning, you ladies rock. <laughs> and the few men in the room are pretty cool too. <laughs> women can, will, are, we are changing this world. We have tremendous power, but it's an, it is imperative that we support and stand up for each other. Oftentimes, I think we women look at each other as our worst enemies, our fiercest competitors. It is so important that we stand up for each other. We have a duty to not only ourselves, but to other women. Otherwise, we all suffer. 
Every one of us here in this room has the ability to make a positive difference in our communities and in our society. As President Clinton demonstrated in that phone call to Kim Jong-il, even the smallest actions can have a huge impact. They can change lives, they can save lives. The people I have met over the years, from those fearless monks in Myanmar who rose up against a brutal dictatorship, to women in both Iran and Turkey speaking out for their rights, to journalists like Arturo who continue to do their jobs despite being the target of violent drug cartels, <coughs> to young people who have experienced suicidal thoughts but are now helping others get through their struggles, to the brave people of North Korea. These are, these are heroes to me whose stories have taught me about courage and strength in the face of adversity and about the value of freedom that too many of us take for granted. Our unalienable right, our freedom, is a non-existent concept for others. Some risk their lives to experience the liberties we enjoy. Others will never know what freedom is. And so I ask you, how can we truly take ownership of our liberty to seize it and value it, not just as a basic right, but as a responsibility? I would like to close today by reciting a excerpt from a poem that I recited to myself nearly every day of my captivity. Some of you here may be familiar with it. It's from the late, great Dr. Maya Angelou. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the caged bird sings of freedom. There are too many people in this world living as caged birds, living in countries where they're unable to express themselves freely, where criticizing their government could land them in prison, where they don't have the right to vote. To people who are going through their own personal tragedies, who feel caged in, trapped, and alone. I urge you all here to cherish your freedoms and to be a strong voice for those who need one. Thank you all very much.